Welcome to episode three of the Hero Shop podcast. Uh, my name is Judson Morgan. I am your host. I'm just learning how to podcast, but I'm, I'm going to call myself a host. I've got one of my fave dudes in the space, George Reed, on the podcast today. And the reason he's one of my favorite guys and one of the guys that I thought of first to bring on the show is because he has a blog called George's.blog. Did I say that right? <laughs> you nailed it, mate. It's very simple and Sweet. you nailed it. Yeah, very easy. It's his name dot blog. And he, he, he uh, pushes out like really cool, the best sort of e-com and Amazon content that's out there. Like the coolest photos, videos and stuff like that. Right. That's basically oh, yeah. what it is, right? Yeah. So you're asking for my confirmation. Yeah. I didn't hear the question mark, but yeah, the essence is quite simple of um, lots of people in the e-commerce space usually have a job, I guess. They've got a full-time role, so it can be very difficult for them to consume all of the content that is out there. So Judson, you've produced, shared loads of content yourself in, in the content world, um, but then on the advertising world on Amazon, there's loads of content, and then the fulfillment world of Amazon, there's loads. So I see my role in the, the ecosystem as to consume as much as possible and because there is a lot of shoddy content, we didn't discuss swearing rules, by the way, so I, I dumbed it down a bit there. Um, there's a lot of shoddy content at the moment, so my rule is to kind of filter and break it down really nicely um, so people can consume in three minutes what I've learned that full week. And that's become, over the last year, kind of my, my staple piece of material I share. Yeah, it's wonderful. And um, so that there, you've got an email list. I would totally recommend joining his email list. He, he, he's giving different content than anybody else in the space. And it's, it's refreshing. There's a lot of times where I'm like, I click on a link or read something that he posts or like he, he often links to LinkedIn or even to, to own like content that he's found, like really cool, a brand that's doing really cool stuff or whatever. And I'll send it to my team and say, here, send it to my designers, send it to my photographer, my video guys would be like, look at this. This is a really cool example of something we could do or whatever. So I think that's a really good resource and something that's like sort of underutilized, um, so anyway, you also, could you give us a little bit more of your intro? You also have an agency in the space. You're doing, you know, helping people with PPC, with creative. Is that right? Yeah, abs absolutely right. So the background was I worked at Amazon, transitioned, went, went freestyle with that and set up an agency. Did a lot in education. Now I'm focusing on managing ads for people on, on Amazon advertising. And then created this kind of Amazon creatives thing where there was a big demand for people going, do you have an example of this? Do you have an example of that? Which, you know, is a designer's probably a big question when, when you work with a brand is, can you give us some examples? They usually don't have examples. I want to fill that gap right there, solve that problem by going out and finding loads of great examples on Amazon of good creative A-plus storefronts made images, infographics. From that then came okay, like, who am I recommending these people to? And they go, I really like these 10 things you've shared, George. Who do we know that can do that? Um, and my mindset has always been, you don't necessarily need to pay for a local resource to get the highest quality result. So if you want really high quality designs, you don't need to go to an American resource, a UK resource, an Australian, where the price point is much higher. Um, so my team, for instance, they're in Brazil. And what I like to do is take that, that lower cost of employment and pass that on to the customer, the client, um, and act as that middleman. So you can get a really high quality piece of content at more of an affordable price, let's say, um, where there's a lot more value packed in. That's been my big belief. I do the same with the advertising as well. Um, but they're the two pillars, kind of content, Amazon creatives, um, and then the traffic piece, which is the advertising. So when you when you think about cost or price for your different services, so let's talk about the, I'm assuming you do A plus content, you do photo, like infographic design, anything mm -hmm. else on the creative side? So we do the storefront, we do the A plus, right. and we do any of those main images, which could be lifestyle, infographics, and just main images as a whole, I guess. Okay. And, um, and do you have like a pricing sort of structure for that stuff? Yeah. So ours is, it may shock you because I don't even think you know our pricing. So at the moment we've just come out of beta. We're doing like a six month beta and we charge for an A plus page 360 pounds, which is massively cheaper from the $1,500 I've been 
quoted multiple times over in the US. And is the quality any different? No. Is ours superior or inferior? No. In some cases, it is superior, um, but it's certainly not inferior. And I just love passing that on. So the team in Brazil, they they get paid very well. Um, I take the bit in the middle and the client gets a really highly valuable service there from us. And that's something I've kind of obsessed over a little bit for the last two plus years. So is that about 500 bucks? Mm, yeah, circa 500 bucks. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good price. And... Um... Do you have, I imagine that you have clients still saying, ah, that's a little much for an A-plus content. Or, or not that they're not, maybe they're not necessarily saying that your price is bad, but they're not really going to spend it. They're not ready to spend it. Do you, you come up against that? Yeah. So like just recently we had someone ask for five images to be done and they were like squeezing me on price. And I'm like, fuck, it's just a waste of my time. <laughs> I was like, if you're going to squeeze on price, fine, but like no one benefits here. But the designers, I do a profit share with the designers as opposed to paying them. Like I decided to go, listen, I'm, I can charge a little bit higher than what you may be able to charge. So I prefer to do a profit share and give them a healthy chunk of the profit because because of the name and the branding, I'm able to obviously charge a little bit higher than what if they went directly. But I'm also coming on loads, loads lower than other big agencies in the US. And that's why I like to kind of position myself. But you're still going to get people squeezing it. And for those who are squeezing it, what invariably happens is they're the ones who also cut corners with regards to going out and getting good raw materials. So this particular client who squeezed me, their raw materials were shit. Like They didn't have very good photos. They were sending us iPhone photos and then expecting top of the class results in a, in a supplement space, right? Which is insane. Right? You're, you're never going to be able to compete in really aggressive marketplaces like the supplement category by taking iPhone photos. It's just a joke. So those projects, just I'm quickly learning. I'm new to the design world in terms of the agency piece, but I'm quickly learning to pass more clients than I accept because in mm-hmm. my view, I want us to have a, a reel of exceptional A+, rather than some average ones. So I've got no interest. Yeah. If you're not going to be on my front page of my website on, on that piece, I'm not interested in working together because you're not investing yourself into it, not just your, your money, but your time and your energy to, to make this project a success. Um, and that's no fun for anyone. You don't get the brilliant result you want, a beautiful A-plus page, which is first in class, and we don't get it either. No one benefits. So the cheap people... What you often find is they're cheap across the board and the end result is always lower. So you might as well pass on them, to be frank. Yeah, they're going to end up not liking the work for some reason mm-hmm. that, that doesn't really make sense. And they, they, they penny pinched you and then they don't like the work. And so it's like double, double whammy. Um, yeah, it's, it, I fi- we find that to be true too. So if you're out there and you're a brand owner, you know, don't be one of those clients because you're, you're going to end up getting worse, you know, creative, the content's going to, you know, be uninspired and, um, you know, the, it's going to be a bummer for everybody. And, uh, yeah, go ahead. I think, you yeah, to speak to that? My, my big one there is if you're going to invest in anything and invest in the raw materials. So an average designer can probably do some pretty good stuff with the right directions. If you've got exceptional photos, like if you've just gone, we've invested our like our eighty percent, shall we say, of the budget in a photographer or a videographer for the day, and we've got really good yeah. raw materials there, or we've paid a renderer to go get a render made of X Y Z product, which massively brings down yep. the cost. You know, there's a renderer I work with in Bulgaria, I think it is, and it's eighty USD for the model to be mocked up, and then it's about twenty five USD per image, so you can get for around about 200 USD, five really strong images from of your product from different angles, which will likely be far superior to some of the other main images on the search results page on Amazon. With those really good ones, you can actually go and make something brilliant, and that's 200 bucks. That's just the working smart as opposed to hard or throwing money at it. And a render kind of is the um, the, the, the quick way to success as well because they can get turned around quicker rather than booking in with a photographer. But for the lifestyles, like I got my friends to do some recently, 
and he's an amateur photographer with a good camera and he went down with a product and took some exceptional photos at Bondi Beach for me um, and it just leveled up everything. You just had a friend, they walked down, it took him 10 minutes, he said. He edited them up a little bit in an hour and they were sensational. If you've got a friend, it helps. If you've got to go get the photographer, it's obviously an expensive thing, but by God, it's, it's such a good investment because it's going to level up yeah. everything you're doing. I remember when we got started, uh, we're, we're here in Southern California and we would go down to the beach and just get some shots. I would do some shoots and I, I'm actually a photographer, uh, yeah, professional photographer from back in the day. So I could get some really killer stuff, but then the issue becomes at scale. So like we have 125 SKUs, my brands, and it just became impossible. So like SKU number 34 is like, I can't go down and shoot it. We got to figure out a way to scale this. And so, you know, it, it's an issue, the actual shooting part. And the if I recommend anyone out there who's getting um, started, for sure, do what George just said. That's that's absolutely right. Make sure you get some lifestyle photos, even if it's a photographer that's a friend or it's, you know, you can go and shoot some photos for sure. Um, it becomes an issue. I think the re place where uh, an agency comes into play is when, you know, like you're, you're not Thrasio, so you can't hire a full in-house creative team but you want really good creative batch couple, two, three, four of your newest products and do like a big bang up shoot and get all the content you need for the next two years um, at, you know, a fraction of what it would cost to do one off or whatever. Um, it sounds like a good plan to me. I, let me, let me give you a couple uh, questions on what you said. First of all, the, can I give you three questions and at once? Are you ready for that? You can go and try. Yeah, well, let's see how clever I'm feeling this morning. Let's see. Let's see if he can. Yeah, let's see how if he can deal with it. He's in Australia, so it's it's early in the morning. So I'm um, stuck in Australia. They won't let him leave. Um, it's a movie. You're living a movie. You're gonna meet a local. And I should you're gonna, start a vlog. No, yeah. Can, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> foreigner trapped at COVID trapped in, Oh, there, there's, this is totally going to be a movie. So people are going to make this movie. Yeah. I, can I just, see you know, like already. there's probably 10 independent movies that are going to be made for Sundance next year. They're like some story of trapped in New York city, COVID Bam film Australia. festival. Here I come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'll send my team over and we'll make it. You, you just uh, come up with a storyline. Okay. So my three questions, a plus content, um, do you have any examples like split test type of thing, case studies that show the benefit of a plus content? Like we, before and after you ran, you know, you ran the numbers, sessions, conversion rate, whatever, I guess it would be conversion rate, right? That's mostly what it would benefit. Do you have examples like that? Question number two, do you have a system around creating a plus content that you could talk us through um, or how you think about it? Like how should people think about a plus content? What, you know, what are the pitfalls? What are the things like, make sure you do this for sure. You know, that kind of thing. I'm sure you have something like that in place. Um, third, 3d renders. I would love to talk about if you have experience with testing, if 3d renders are better or worse. Um, and, I have some thoughts on 3D renders and I would love to chat about that. Maybe that, that can be your third answer. Okay. Good questions. First and foremost, uh, an example of content that we've uploaded. We, our first piece of A+, this beauty brand that had their shit together. She was a really nice woman um, over, uh, over in the U.S., and she was just one of those people who are brilliant to work with. At times, obviously challenging because it was quite demanding, but that was fine because she just had everything beautifully organized. Here are all our fonts. Here are all our color schemes. Here's our, how our brand kind of uh, brand Bible works and your whole walkthrough of that. Here is all our lifestyle images, all our product images, all our icons. And they're the dream, obviously, as a designer to go pick it up because it makes life a lot easier. So we worked with, with her and create, created one strong A-plus page. And the conversion rate month before was something around about 15%. Um, I wrote about this the other day so I can get the exact quote. And then the conversion rate for the month after was around about 28%. It was a huge uplift in conversion rate. Wow. And this is ties and that's in... just A-plus content? So yes. Or was that the theory, full design? In theory, that was just A plus content. Did was that the only thing that impacted it that month? No, it's Amazon, right? 
the price didn't change. There was no special promotions on offer. There are many other things at play. Like we're managing her advertising as well. There may have been a, a link in us taking over the ads in that same month and being better at driving more warm traffic or more relevant traffic, which would have contributed to that conversion rate. But you're never going to be able to fully understand it. All we know is we uploaded the A+, plus in the next month, conversion rate increased by 13% incremental gain. So that is one example. And that feeds into this conversation. You know, there'll be people sitting around and having Skype meetings, or I don't know why I said Skype, who uses Skype, <laughs> Teams meetings, um, right now, wondering whether they take on that that design agency in uh, called George's blog. Um, and they'll be looking at the cost, and they'll be going, oh, it's going to be £360 for this, this ASIN. That's a lot of money. And then they're not looking at, this A plus had an impact of 13% in month one. That compounds. That's additional reviews. Month two, it's 13%. Three, four, five, it's 13%. Higher conversion rate. As it then peaks towards Q4, traffic goes up. What does that 13% conversion rate actually mean? And what you'll probably realize is even if we were charging £2,000, you would still see a return on your investment if you're a medium-sized seller, saying doing more than 15 k a month, on that £2,000 within a one-year period. Um... And that's kind of small numbers. Obviously, if you're doing 15 grand and one ASIN and you can increase your conversion rate significantly, it's a game changer. Um, Because what your end objective should always be is, are we taking steps to get a better organic sales rank? Yes, no. If we are, then let's continue doing that. That is the end objective here. And I talk about, I spoke about it yesterday, the email list and why we send from the email list to Amazon and sacrifice margin because the end goal is, to be ranked higher on Amazon. Part one, um, do you want to ask questions or do you want me to go into the system? I, I, that's a great answer. And, I, and I'll just follow up with saying that, you know, conversion rate, increasing conversion rate is one of Amazon's favorite things, right? And so they're going to give you more ranking as you convert and it's the snowball effect. So you, you, you pay off the 2,000 pounds or the 500 pounds within a month or two, realistically, because you're making so many more sales, your ACOS is going down, your raw is going up, your, everything's working better. Um, conversion rate greases all the wheels. And then it's just the, the flywheel takes off the Amazon flywheel, and that's why we're all on Amazon. And then, you know, it, it's, it's such a, a bigger thing than like, I'm going to spend 500 bucks and, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, my sales went up by one or two. Per, it's a, it's a, it's a um, long-term play that people aren't, they aren't taking advantage of enough. And I think uh, you spoke to it well, but I just wanted to make that follow-up point. So it's, the term is an investment. Go, go for it on to. Your, that's, that's the term, right? That, yeah, that's the key exactly. way to look at it. It is not a cost. It is an investment similar to how, when you're buying your product and you're going, mm, should we, should we invest and in that designer to design our packaging? So it doesn't look shit because we did it on Canva. Yeah, we probably should. That is an investment and you can you can understand in your head that it's an investment. Um, but people sometimes struggle to understand that this is an investment. Your content always will be. And that's why the raw materials are so important and that photographer and render is important. Um, the system piece, hmm, it's a tricky, tricky one here. The rule of thumb I'm applying here is... I guess, how can we differentiate? So at the moment, what we know about A+, is the copy inside A+, doesn't really have any impact on your um, keyword ranking. It's not indexed. It's indexed on Google, I've heard, but not, not on Amazon. So there's not necessarily any benefit in having more copy there. Plus, you've already had all the copy exa- opportunities in the world with your title and bullets. You don't need to ram it down their throats in A+. A+, is there to, to wow, in my opinion is there to cross-sell, in my opinion, is there to showcase more of your brand's identity, in my opinion. You used a brilliant term to me a while ago about everything that you do, run run your content through your brand's filter. Um, and someone said to me a while ago, which he came up with another way of looking at it, it's like a paella pan where you don't wash it properly. 
um, you keep cooking it over and over again. It kind of you always throw your raw materials into your paella pan. You throw your images and your um, other content into it, and it picks up that kind of brand identity whilst it's in the pan. Exactly the same with your with your A plus. So my rule of thumb, my system there is to create landing pages, um, styled format, image, 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 usually as a banner um, with text embedded into those images rather than writing the copy out because this allows you to use your own brand fonts your own brand voice um your own brand's kind of attitude um i could probably come up with better describing words there but they'll have to do for now that's why i always view it as a landing page rather than ever thinking about using amazon's suggested modules because they're too limited right now um so that is the only yeah. one a two rule of thumb system piece I have. That's great, and and it's and it's uh, Amazon's modules are ugly. They're yeah. very poorly designed. They're not aesthetic, and the font that they use is not aesthetic. And it's it <clears throat> it doesn't build your brand. It builds Amazon's brand, and that's okay. You know, I mean, I think the stats are still. Uh, you know, I think people are still think a lot of people think they're buying from Amazon. So, right, they go on, they don't realize they're buying, unless they're buying Nike, they don't realize when they buy my brand or your brand or whoever's, they don't, they think they're buying from Amazon. So I think that's still there. But um, I think there's this bigger, so you and I are in agreement on the system, this sort of like the take, your take on A plus content. So my last guest, Stephen Pope from my Amazon guy has a different perspective. He's an SEO guy. He fully admits that his designs are not cool looking. (laughs) <laughs> and he fully admits that he doesn't do good branding. And they offer this as a service design, but they they fully admit that it's not that cool. And you and I are like, cool design converts. And he is like, keyword ranking matters more. So he stuffs his keywords into A plus content. You and I do not. And I'm of the exact same mind as you. You have enough other places to stuff your keywords. And it doesn't index any better. So he, he's he got some stats that say that it does index in, in A-plus content. But I think your your point still stands that the there's enough keyword spaces other places to, ra- I mean, to rank for as, and enough keywords, right? So mm-hmm. his is an SEO game. Your, your, you and I have more of a branding game. And, and I guess it would depend to a certain extent on your product line. Um, all the products that I create in my brands and a lot of the brands that we work with, it, it, it's important that they look cool. You know, like I have like a designed in Los Angeles brand, you know, and it's like, mm-hmm. it's got to look like it's designed in Los Angeles, <laughs> everything about it. Right. So it's, it's, um, that's, that's part of what differentiates my brands because I'm a, you know, I'm a branding guy and a creative guy. And I think, I think there's, a little bit of a white space there on Amazon where there aren't that many people doing that thing, which really interested me about your blog and what you're doing. Cause it's just funny. You would think more people would be having these conversations, but they're not. Most of them are having that conversation. The one, the, 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 my Amazon guy type, type combo. My, I guess, counter argument is one of the biggest threats I hear on Amazon from asking pretty much every single person I've had on, on my podcast, when I say, what's the biggest threat? Is China or it's Amazon themselves? So if you tackle China, for instance, which I do believe is one of the biggest threats, what the Chinese at the moment are not very good at is creating something cool, like you've said. They, they don't seem to be able to do it. So how can you differentiate? Well, China are going to be, let's say, Stephen's Stephen's mindset of, we'll stuff keywords into it, and it doesn't look very good. It looks a bit goofy. China can replicate that really easily. So when you create a product and you do the keyword stuffing, you create something goofy, fine. China does exactly the same. You haven't got a point of differentiation. What you can do, which will differentiate, is go create something really cool, something unique something that a customer connects with on a different level, um, that they resonate with on a different level and makes them want to buy from you not just once, but twice, two, three, four, five times. And that starts, that process yep. starts where you're invoking an emotion on on that product page or on the first main image as well, for that matter. But then when they go onto the product page, they've got more to 
opportunities to invoke. So that is a big one to go. This is the brand Motan building, which is going to protect me from China. And I'd be terrified if I had a shitty brand right now with some random stuff, keywords and amateur images, because you've got Thrasso coming into the space and the others like it. You've got Amazon, whose teams are getting bigger and bigger when it comes to um, their own brand development. And then you've got China getting really bloody good at still pumping products into, into the US and European marketplaces. What are you doing to build the brand mode? It's, very, it's a very, very, very good point and one that I've made in other ways and I think you just said it very well and I think it's massively important and one of the reasons we wanted to start this podcast in particular is because I think this conversation is important for folks who are starting brands now or who have their brand and they're getting kind of eaten alive by Chinese sellers or by Amazon itself. Amazon's terrible at content as well. So mm -hmm. what can differentiate us is what George is saying is that brand storytelling and something unique and like a unique perspective about you know, your brand, your products, who you are as a person, whatever it is, if you want to be the face of your brand, there's a bunch of different ways to go about it. But I think it's massive and we're not going to beat them on price. We're not going to, you know, they can steal all your keywords just by using a, a reverse ASIN tool. So you can't hide your keywords, but they cannot tell a brand story. They cannot copy that. And mm -hmm. it actually, it actually goes to my next point about the, the third question I had to you about 3D renders. There's this sort of bigger conversation I want to have about content, even the, the, the Photoshopped content. So 3D renders, they can be very, very good where it's like better than a photo, but they also can I think there's something psychological that goes on where, you know, those like the, those milliseconds that we um, translate an image into what it mm. means. Yes. And I think Photoshopped imagery, I think sometimes 3D renders, unless it's like an incredibly done 3D render, it, it makes, it seems like, and I'll say it this way, it sort of like falsifies the product. It's like, hmm, this might be a cheap Chinese knockoff product just to say it that way. Right. Yep. Um, so I think content sort of without, without saying it, it sort of tips the scale and, and people are savvy. People, buyers are smart. They've bought a bunch of stuff that didn't turn out the way they wanted. So I, I think the, the content that we create really matters in that way. Like if you have like a, a model that's clearly pasted on there from a stock imagery and it looks, you know, let's say it looks like, clearly from like a different country probably. And then you're pasting this imagery into, you know, you know what I'm saying? It, it speaks to like, okay, this product probably isn't super high quality. I, I completely agree with you. So for me, renders serve a purpose for main images, white background, or, you know, we see those images where it's just the product in it. It's on a colored background. And maybe you've got the same the product, let's say a drinks can, and you've got 30 of them in a row, for instance. And you get a render mocked up of that for, for the, that sort of thing. Those kind of Instagram-y sort of images, which we need. I think they serve a purpose. And that's why I think the render is great because it makes it pop. And particularly on mobile when we can be really flexible and the zoomed in version also looks sensational. The keywords on side your packaging can be seen from the search results page, also key. Yep. Um, yep. That helps with a render. That's where I think they serve their purpose. When you look to blend renders with lifestyles, it starts to fall to pieces and you start to look about like the Chinese copycats. Lifestyles, you need them. Yes, you can. You know, Nespresso, for instance, with some of their machines, they're clearly renders mocked up with a blurred background lifestyle and they can make it look really good and so it can be done but when you get a human involved holding at any product that's when it all falls to pieces in my opinion yeah yeah you, you can clearly see sometimes where the product is like photoshopped into somebody's hand and it's clearly they were holding something else all of those things I would stay away from and keep a very um, – we, we have a Chinese supplier, a Chinese um, competitor in one of our uh, niches. And um, Do you say niche or niche? Niche. <laughs> 
Oh, niche. Okay. Um, in, in one of our niches where they are killing it, they're dominating. Their product is pretty good. The product itself, their imagery and their content is bad. And, but what they're doing that's smart is they're basically, they have two images or three images at most, and they keep it super basic. They're not trying to fake it. They're just like, okay, our contents, we don't have any content. So we're just going to, here's the product. The product speaks for itself. It's got a better price than everybody else. It's got more reviews than everybody else. We're not going to worry about the content. Essentially is, is kind of my take on what, maybe they don't know that's what they're doing, but that works from my perspective, works better than them trying to do a bunch of Photoshopped bad content. Um, I, I find that to be interesting because- it's judged on your worst image, right? Exactly, dude. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> I, I was going to be my next point. You guys, everybody out there, do you know this? So the, I'll give you an example. We, we do a lot of casting in Hollywood, like actors and models and stuff like that, right? I've been doing this for 15 years. My wife's an actor. Um, when- a, an actress or an actor, a, a guy or a girl sends us their like portfolio of images or their portfolio of videos. Like here's me doing a comedy. Here's me. The image where they look the worst, I tell my team, that's what they really look like. And inevitably they come into the room and that's what they look like. They don't look like the best one. They look like the worst one. And so I think people know this. Like if you have seven images and there's one where your product looks kind of funky, that's what people are like. That's probably what it really looks like. So I think that's a, that's a, a daily hack or a, a tip for today that we can, we can give everybody. Um, delete that. Make yeah, sure you're, all, you're your image, all, your, all your content is on a level. Yeah, it's, yes. we see that a lot, you know, where someone, it's like keyword stuffing for images. People are like, I've got seven or whatever it is now, space. Yes. I need, I need to add another one which in theory does make sense. More images helps the algorithm go. You've got more content, which is good for customers, so we'll give you a bit of juice. But if that image is going to decrease your conversion rate, it's going to have negative impact and limit your sustainable success, essentially. So remove it. Don't always jump onto Canva unless you're pretty damn competent to add those icon images where you go, here are six features of our product can be done on Canva, it really can, and it can come out okay. But not if you've never used Canva before. You may spend six hours trying to make it look average. Um, so yeah, you are judged on your worst image, and that can just turn someone off and make them go, oh, this is just coming from China, isn't it? It's a knockoff. And that can just drive your conversion right down. It's very, very, very interesting. Um, this is a concept I haven't thought through, and I'm, and I'm kind of loving it, just kind of like hashing this out with you. It's like, one thing we haven't done with my brands or with the agency is like just one, one thing to try is just delete that worst image. Go, you know, and, and see maybe that mm -hmm. will give you um, a little bit of a bump. It's, it's interesting. Never, it's not a test we've never tried. I, I'm, I'm assuming it's true, but that's, that's fascinating. Um, okay, so go ahead. Yeah, record the data before, record the data the month after, see what impact it has and see if you change anything else. So if traffic was roughly the same, like we got 10,000 visits and 10,000 visits the following month, did conversion rate change at all? Because you know the rule of thumb I have is cover up your bullet points and your title and just use the images and pretend like the customer isn't going to even see any of that copy. Do the images firstly provide enough information to make them make a well-informed decision? Secondly, do they do the job at converting them as well? There's that one image that just goes, Ugh, that is a bit grim actually. It's like that one picture of an apartment that you're viewing and you go, oh, that, that one with the kitchen, like the lighting's awful. I'm not even going to go view that. Forget it. Whereas if they didn't have the kitchen one, the Aussies are pretty scummy for this. They'll fake all the photos. But those who have like got one normal photo in there probably get a lot less viewings. Whereas they're like, we just put the best photos up because it encourages people to come through. You've obviously got to follow through and have a good product. Otherwise, the whole system kind of comes to a halt. Um, but it's a, a very simple way of looking at it. You know, it, the, this whole content thing is so interesting because 
you think about Airbnb. I don't know if you've stayed in a lot of Airbnbs. Um, but have you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We have two. And we, we ended up, my wife, uh, was shooting a TV show in Vancouver for five years. And every year we would pick a Airbnb from here and never see it only the pictures. And we were going to stay there for like two to five months. And so it was like a big commitment. So this imagery, these Im this the story they're telling about their Airbnb, whether it's like they set up. So I've got th I've got kids, and so they set up a little setup in their photo shoot where they've got or in their house with like with um, toys and whatever. Like oh my gosh, you know my son could totally play right there. They paint this picture, the content they create. It's like it's it's not just Amazon. It's not just e-commerce. It's like any internet business the imagery and the way that they tell that story is just so massively important. It's, it's, I'm just realizing it's like, it's such a huge skill set for our life. For modern life is this like being able to tell it's a story with content. Future pacing, I believe, isn't it? Yeah. Well, no, explain that. What, what, what do you, I, I, it's, I, I believe that it's, it's a psychological thing, future pacing where, Yeti do it really, really well there. Um, yes. The, what I guess, cool box brand. Yeah. And what they do brilliantly is they will put a picture of some person kitted out in the sexiest of Patagonia gear, um, Patagucci. Um, and they'll have the Yeti flask on the go whilst they sit in Banff National Park having completed a sweaty hike. And when we see an image like that, the body actually starts to experience what that life would be like, i.e., wow, sat on top of that mountain, having done just done this hike, having this exceptional view, being an active person who accomplishes stuff and impresses their friends. And then they see Yeti and the, the mug, and they associate the, the positive endorphins that will come from the activity that you're seeing with the object. So in their head they start to future pace to a life of having the object and therefore experiencing the activity. Same as what you've just said with Airbnb, you're future pacing yourself to a life inside of that home for five months and can see your three kids playing with the toys. Therefore, it is much easier because you're thinking about that positive experience as you've got your morning coffee on the go. They're entertained and you know that is a nice experience. And that is the future pacing aspect. So you're going, I like that idea, that image in my head. So I'm sold on this. So I have, I, I mean, I think I've heard the phrase future pacing, but um, I, I, it was, I, I didn't, I guess I didn't know what it meant. So you're, you're seeing yourself in the future with, you know, in whatever scenario. So maybe it's with that product or in that Airbnb or whatever. That's what, that's what the concept is. That's the concept. Yeah. You know, a simple way of looking at it is, People who, <laughs> coffee is always a good one. People who sell coffee, I saw this recently with one of our clients and his lifestyle image obviously was pouring the coffee into a mug, right? Everyone does that because you want to sell that experience. But unfortunately, like the, the coffee cups they're chosen were pretty grim. They just weren't very nice. They looked like the basic ones you get at a cheap corner cafe in a rough part of London. And no one's going, that looks delightful. Whereas if you kind of, pulled out all the stops and had a Harrods equivalent, let's say, of something beautiful or some beautiful home with the coffee maker there and the coffee beans there and their future paced into a home, a lifestyle. And they don't realize at that point in time that you're not going to get a million dollar home and the most beautiful surface top made of whatever granite and the most fantastic coffee mugs. They don't realize that. But what they do see is this coffee is associated with that. So you get kind of subconsciously, and this happens in split seconds, they get kind of lured into that, um, that idea and believe it to be true for a future self. It, it's, um, I'm not a psychologist, but someone, someone would explain that better than I can. No, it's great. And I think, um, you know, you know, the guy uh, who is a psychologist, Ben Hardy. Have you heard of him? He mm -hmm. puts a lot of content out on YouTube. I haven't, no. Yeah. And he, um, he talks about, you know, being a business, uh, business owner, entrepreneur or whatever, but he, he talks a lot about psychology and our psychology as human beings and how we kind of hack our psychology and what we're really doing. And I think, you know, it, it's, it's easy to forget that 
we aren't selling a physical product, right? We're selling this future pacing. We're selling um, this person's. So the, the way that I the way that I talk about this is every every human being is living a story. You know, I'm living a story. I really only care about myself. You care about yourself. You're on this podcast because it's going to benefit you. It feels good for me to want you on the podcast. It feels good for me to listen to you. I'm telling you you're smart. And likewise, right? I feel good because you're on my podcast Mm -hmm. and we hope that there's benefit for other people and that will make me feel good. But it's really about me. My, you know, my, I have three young kids and they're completely 100% unable to conceive of their brother's needs or, you know what I mean? It's, it's, we are born as completely (laughs) selfish beings and we never fully get out of that. It's like, so as marketers, as like brand owners, as, as Airbnb owners, it doesn't matter. We are, there, there is this story that's happening for all these other human beings in the world and try to insert our product into that story and say, okay, our product fills a need that you have. And so if we can I think there's just such a psychological sort of subconscious game that's going on here. That's like 80% of it. And we, we too often are stuck on this like Mm -hmm. 20%. I'm going to do this. I'm going to hack this. I'm going to do these keywords. I'm going to do whatever it is in our business model. And there's this whole 80% that's really going on. That's like the psychology of why someone picks that product up or why they pick that Airbnb or that, that Snickers bar or whatever it is that I is just so fascinating. It gets me energized. And I, and, and and I just, don't you agree that we, we, we forget that. I mean, you talk about it, but, but you know what I mean? Like we, don't you think we're just for the most part, like forgetting this? Yeah. I mean, it's all happening subconsciously, right? Um, like a, a, a great example of this is the, the iPad advert last year during, during lockdown. And they, they, did a full future pacing advert and all they focused on was was the benefits of the new iPad. They never talked about the features and this is staple e-commerce, right? Benefits over features. And that's kind of what you're tapping into. That the benefit for them having toys in the Airbnb or the benefit of having nice mugs in the pictures is painting a picture of a better quality of life for you personally and for those you you care about, which in this case is your family. In this case, is your partner who has a morning coffee with you. Um, so iPad did that, well, Apple did that brilliantly with that advert, and it's kind of top of class for it. And yeah. Yeti do it brilliantly, and, and lots of the brands do that brilliantly. Um, but a lot, I'd say 80% fall short and struggle with it um, because there isn't always that brilliant creative direction. But, you know, some simple things that everyone can get behind is... Um, there's a company I like to follow called Wild Cosmetics or Wild Deodorant. And they use a Facebook community quite a lot. So you can tap into the, the psychology of your audience well by understanding, and it comes back to Stephen's point, understanding keywords, or I call them trigger terms. And they asked a poll, it was probably a year and a half ago now, because I've been in the group for a while. And they said, how would you describe us to a friend? And I thought, whilst it's a very simple question, it's actually genius because what they're doing is they're understanding the language that their customer uses, not what their marketing team uses, that they think the benefits or the features of or the nice things about the product are. They're getting to their language so they can resonate with them more. So when you create that A-plus page, instead of putting um, eco-friendly, maybe they put sustainable instead, for instance, because everyone used the term sustainable and eco-friendly mm-hmm. was left yep. to dead. Um, or maybe they use some other random term which the team would have never thought of. So that comes down to tapping in and serving. Post-consumer. Mm-hmm. 100%. That then plays forward to that. Yeah, and, and it resonates differently. Right? Absolutely. You hear these different communities like in, I, I think there's a little delay, so sorry if I'm, if I'm cutting you off, but there's a, you hear communities speak about things in a different way. And it's, uh, it's interesting because I just moved from Los Angeles to Santa Barbara and there's a, they speak a little bit differently. There's a list, you know, it's an hour and a half North and there's just a little bit of a different aesthetic and people wear little different things and they speak a little differently. It's, it's very fascinating. I think you're super right. And I think, let's say you have a hundred reviews on your Amazon product and you're thinking like, how, by the way, um, I would recommend doing this every six months, looking at your product and making sure it's positioned in 
the best way. The market changes, pricing changes, things change. Other people come in, they're better than you. Other people, things come come up. I don't know if you have like a recommended time when, you know, to like kind of revamp content or whatever. But w- what I was going to say just real quick is if you have a hundred um, reviews, go look at those reviews. They will give you your language. They're going to give you mm-hmm. exact like they're going to tell you that people are going to say like, oh my gosh, I love this for this, this, and this. I used it this mm-hmm. way. So like we have this example of like, you know, a blanket that we thought was a picnic blanket, but like it turned out to be a yoga blanket. We had no idea, right? You, you find these things out through the reviews, through you. So if you don't have a community like the, what George was saying with that cosmetics brand, you can do it through Amazon reviews. You get your first 10 reviews. They're going to tell you exactly what people think of your product. And then you can position it exactly the way that they speak about it. So you're, you're using the keywords, but you're psychologically connecting with what they're doing and what they're saying. I completely agree. I think six months is a good time to revisit your content, just so you can stay on the pulse of things. I think Amazon reviews are great. It's very easy using a Helium 10 extension to pull them down and categorize them, understand volume behind each keyword, fantastic. Um, but let's not forget qualitative data as well. Um, which can come from a Facebook group, let's say. So certain people are more savvy, mm-hmm. let's say, leaving a review on Amazon. So say if your demographic is a larger percentage or over 40, um, but all your reviews have actually come from under under 40 people because they're more savvy. Let's make that argument. It may or may not be true. But all your reviews are from people sub 40. So if you just used Amazon reviews for instance, would you get one side of the coin? Whereas if you used a Facebook group where every man and his dog knows how to post a comment on Facebook, hence why lots of millennials' parents upset them regularly by posting random stuff on there, would that give you a different insight? Because Joe Bloggs' mom, who's been buying stuff from the same brand, got a little post on a group and she loves engaging in this group and she's really comfortable adding a little comment there and someone's reading through going, wow, this is a completely different take on it. They're all using slightly different terminology, or they're all posting slightly different shots or slightly different problems. And that age group may not be familiar with how to leave a review on Amazon, despite how easy some of the black hat people make it to do so. A um, little dig there at black hat sellers. So that's another, I've only just thought about it now, but do you perhaps just get one side of the coin with Amazon reviews because people are more tech savvy and know how to use Amazon and leave a review. Whereas some are not as tech savvy and want to have a phone conversation, for instance, or want to um, want to post in a Facebook group. And the phone conversation, another one, right? Like I've got a I chair seller. They're never yeah. going to leave a review on Amazon because some of them, they're orthopedic based. They could be yep. 60 plus. Like they're not logging on to leave a review. Whereas if you, obviously, Black Hat again, gave them a call and go, like, how are you getting on? We, we arranged the, the delivery, but we now want to check you're loving your chair. Can you just let us know some feedback verbally? You don't need to go leave a review on Amazon. We don't care about that. We just want to understand in your words as a 75-year-old woman why you like this chair. I think I think it's smart. Um, I think you're right. There is, there is a demo of people that would never leave an Amazon review. Um, I think I'm one of them, and I think... Um, it would be wise to, if you have a social media following, that's another way you can just, um, you know, post a story with a, with a quiz on it or whatever, po- po- you know what I mean? Those kinds of things on Instagram, we do that all the time, even for product dev. So we would say like, Hey, here's three products we're thinking about, you know, producing next. And w- w- which one do you want us to do? And, and they'll tell us, or like mm-hmm. between these three colors, what do you like best? Um, you know, and, and you can also do that kind of thing on PickFu as well. Give me a, before we go into the rapid fire, can we, can you give me a um, like a take on Australia, the Amazon marketplace for Australia? How how is it? You're down there. Do you buy things on Amazon? And um, do you uh, do you have sellers, <laughs> Australian sellers? Yeah. And and so so the follow up is: th- Should I launch in Australia? Should I, should my brands launch in Australia? Okay. Um, first and foremost, Australia's launched and it's it's certainly growing and it's growing quite nicely. But is it an exciting marketplace? Probably not yet. But there are some people doing incredibly well. Like there's people I know in Bondi who are some of the top sellers in Australia and they're they're putting in really good revenue. 
Um, and they're able to do that because they've launched early, they've launched with a good strategy and the competition's really low. Um, in the same sense with, with some of the advertising we manage for a couple of people, we're, we're seeing some great results because the cost per click's really low. With regards to Australians as a whole, they're just, they're not that good at e-commerce. They're not jumping on the bandwagon as much as you may think. A lot of people, when people say, what do you do? And I'm like, oh, I run an Amazon agency. They're a little bit struck of what is what is this Amazon thing? Um, so it's still growing, but it's going to take a lot, like another couple of years to penetrate. So to answer your question, I would say yes, because I don't see Amazon pulling out. It's not like a China where they're going to bail after a while. And the quality of individuals in the e-commerce space right here, blanket statement, shoot me, I don't care, is probably pretty low um, just from what I've seen. So if you come in with the right mindset, which obviously you've got having played with Amazon in the US for a long time and succeeded, you can do really, really well and create a strong foothold. So that would be my advice. And it's been my advice for two and a half years, to be honest, and still people aren't doing it. But you've got to be really betting on the long game. Um, but still, the, the platforms, the marketplace as a whole is still a pretty average shopping experience because Prime eligibility, if you click the Prime button, applies to Prime Global as opposed to Prime Local. And you have to filter it down and go, I just want it from Australia. And as a UK person, I've got disgustingly accustomed to next day delivery. And here they're like, you know, I've seen some Prime uh, offering seven day delivery. That was on Prime Day as well, which was mad. Interesting. Okay. Um, that that's a good that's a good take because you hear like Amazon's trying to push us to go into these different marketplaces, and it's like Amazon uh, Australia is growing faster than anybody else, and um, so that's that's interesting. Um, can I tell you one one quick tidbit? Um, I was looking, I, I was uh, looking at this thread on Twitter about Netflix, and I thought it would be very interesting for this podcast. So they were talking about the thumbnails on Netflix are eighty percent of the reason why certain shows get clicked on or not. And so they like the way that we as Amazon sellers sort of optimize for our main image. Netflix optimizes for the thumbnails for their shows. So they go through this, they have, you know, 200 million users or whatever, and they go through like a crazy amount of like testing and data to pick the best thumbnail per geography for different um, Netflix shows. So for example, my wife's show, she has a show on Netflix. When we're in Canada, they show a different thumbnail than when we get to the US. We're like, wait, what happened? So they are testing and iterating off of these main images. They'll create 10, 20, 30 main images, test them, different positions. They And they have all this data that they've collected that's super fascinating. Things like thumbnails with more than three people, three of the actors, don't work. Thumbnails with bad guys work better than thumbnails without. So what they do is they get better and better and better and better over time with getting data, doing tests about what works for their thumbnails on Netflix. And I find that super fascinating and similar to what we should be doing with our main imagery. Um, do you want to speak to that at all? I just thought you'd be interested in that. I can send you the thread. It's super fascinating. Yeah. So... I've seen it as well, where I've logged in from the iPad with a, um, a VPN on because I want to watch uh, certain shows on Netflix UK as opposed to Netflix Australia. And you do see different thumbnails. And I was kind of wondering about that, but it makes absolute sense. I think this is, there's two ways of looking at this. I think this creates a problem because if you're a small seller, or a small brand, or even a medium brand, you don't have the capacity to split test this in great volume. So ideally, you may go, I want to change the way my main image is portrayed. You've got more challenge on Amazon because you need a white background. But you can be playful with that. 
Um, you know, you can add certain overlays and try and be a bit gray if you like. You can do packaging inside of it. You can say packaging from a different angle. Um, the guy at Unilever I follow, um, Oliver Bradley, I think his name is, he talks a lot about if you've got a tall, a long, long shaped image, um, look to chop the product in half in the consumables category and just show half of it so you remove more white space. Um, so you could split test, let's say 10 to 15 different types. But like you said, when you've got a range of 60 plus, this becomes an impossible challenge. Obviously, when you're 60 plus, you're a bigger company. But, and you've got more resource. But my point is, if you're a small brand, it's really, really difficult to test this. So it just the divide between the, the big players and the small players gets bigger and bigger and bigger, which is why I... I'm concerned about what the long-term impact of the likes of Thrasio and other roll-up companies are because people are getting all excited about it now because they go, I can make some money by selling out. How exciting. But for those who aren't selling out, it actually creates another Amazon in the ecosystem, but not just one Amazon, like 30 of them. Amazon, in theory, could split test their main image with some software three billion times and no skin off their nose, I imagine. And the Thrasios of the world could probably set up some software to do the same. But for you average Joe blogs to actually create the content and then set something up to test it and then measure it effectively and then do that across two, three, four images as you grow, that's an incredibly difficult challenge for them. So the the future is a little bit concerning um, unless you're just going to focus on creating a damn good product and a good brand moat and go, we would love to test more remain images to drive click-through, but we can't necessarily do that. Um, and that's, I think, going to become a really interesting problem in the future. Um, but I do think everyone should be testing it because who cares about your A+, plus? who cares about your second, third, fourth, fifth image, who cares about your storefront if no one ever clicks on it because your main image is average? I say that all the time. It's it's uh, the main image is one of the it is should be more of a focus than it is, and uh, it's it's um, it's it's less of a main focus for people than it should be, including myself. So um, I got a little rapid fire question for you, um, or a few of them. So you ready? Fire away, pal. <laughs> okay, what is the most important piece of content for an e-commerce brand or an Amazon brand? Hmm. How would you define content in this particular question? Let's let's pare it down to Amazon. Um, I, mean, I think the answer is probably obvious, but if, if it's just an Amazon product, an Amazon listing. Okay. I'd probably say your your main image is Trump your A plus and your storefront to answer that piece. But then with regards to those main images, if you drill it down further, I always feel that the main, the main, the primary image itself, number one, the thumbnail, whatever term you want to use, is your most important solely because that's the one that will get the click. So the most work probably needs to go into that one. Click comes before conversion at all times. So obsess over the click. Then following on from that, I think infographics probably come second because infographics break down all your bullet points, i.e. the benefits, into a more consumable manner. So they understand if it's a good decision they're making, a good well-informed decision, and they're using the infographic to do that. Um, so on an iPad, you may talk about... Um, high quality FaceTimes. You don't talk about the camera, you talk about high quality FaceTimes, for instance. So these points that convert you. And then the final one would probably be that that lifestyle image because of the future pace and conversation we had earlier. Okay, cool. If you had unlimited funds, if 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 money wasn't an object, like what um you know kind of uh content like I, I mean photos or videos would you like, you know, spend the money on? What would you go out and create? I'd probably go photo to begin with, just because it's easy to consume on Amazon at this point in time. I did hear some stats about videos were 
increase in conversion massively on Amazon, but the number of people watching videos on a product page is quite low, and they're always at the end. Um, so they're not quite coming into play enough at the moment. For that reason, I would invest heavily in the photographer because it's much easier to consume that content. It's much easier to work with that content and repurpose it across different platforms from your storefront, your main images, your A+, your social channels to drive it all into that kind of converting positions where the customers ready to convert. So that's why I'd go for photo at this point in time over video. I think that's a great answer. Um, Photo is essential. Video is a bonus. Um, if you can do video, it does convert, especially for sponsor video ads. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an opportunity because not everybody has it. Um, do you have a favorite brand? Um, and it can be on or off Amazon, obviously, um, you know, that, that's doing like brand storytelling or creative really well. Wild cosmetics that I talk about do this very well and they tap into their community really nicely. I spoke to the creative director there recently as well, and he's got a very good way of looking at things. So Wild Cosmetics um, is the kind of full name of it, but it's actually Wild Deodorant, and the product's really cool. You should check them out anyway. They do really well. On Amazon, some of the best I've seen um, are actually Starbucks. They had one of the best storefronts I've seen with regards to how they take a customer on a journey and navigate them around. Um, other good examples came from, oh, I can't remember the name of that, it's called Protein Bar, I believe, or Power Power Bar, that was it, Power Bar in the UK. They've got a particularly good feature on their storefront where they direct a customer very nicely. Um, Yeti have some really good lifestyle images um, on, on Amazon. And Hippies, H-I-P-P-E-A-S, do a very good job at kind of really getting their color um, into all of their content. Um, so they're not great at everything, but the way they incorporate that yellow is very clever. Yeah, and it really stands out on the page. I think I got that. I noticed that one from your from you posting about it. Um, okay, if you're, I, I didn't give you a heads up on this question, but if you have one prediction for the future of like creative photo and video content, like like for example video being instead of the main image being a photo it's going to be a video you, you know what i mean like all the main images will be videos or something like like something that's going to happen six months or a year from now that we should be looking toward for photos and video creative content on amazon we've already seen in the german marketplace sliding images on the search results page on mobile so you can thumb swipe and look at people's second, third, and fourth image, which makes sense. I'm surprised it's taken so long. This reinforces the importance of having strong portfolio of images, not having a shitty image in that portfolio. Um, so that is probably going to be rolled out across most of Amazon, so really smashing the rest of your portfolio of images. And ensuring you're ticking the other boxes is, is a good takeaway from that. I don't see them doing video on every single listing within the search results. I just don't see it. I think it'd be a poor customer experience. It would annoy people. I'm, I'm not expecting that soon. I think we'll see a lot more storefront-focused content, which is looking to drag people back to Amazon storefronts from brands as opposed to the listing. We're already seeing more and more of that with storefront ads. We're already seeing it with... Um, links directly through to the storefront and how Amazon are changing the wording. So I think storefronts can be one of the biggest plays there. With regards to tech advancements, I think it's getting smarter using technology and pairing that with customer data to make decisions based on images. So Visit, V-I-Z-I-T, have some cool stuff on this. Um, I don't understand how accessible it is to everybody, but I think that's going to shape a lot of our decision making. There is some tech emerging around designers basically being made redundant because AI and machine learning can create content based on stuff, but you still need raw materials from a photographer and you still need that human who understands your customer. Maybe, I don't know, I can see that one being really interesting 
but they still need the raw materials to make it work. Otherwise, you've got them fake looking images, fake looking lifestyles, which we discussed earlier. Yeah. Um, that's great. Uh, th- that's very cool. Cool predictions. Um, I think in the in the US, we already have, you know, you can scroll through the images like this on mobile, um, on Amazon. And I think I just was testing it while we were talking here. And I, I saw one that I looked at the deal of the day and that product, it was an earbud. The second the, I swiped to the left and that the next image was a video. So um, that's interesting, right? So um, the uh, how, how can people get a hold of you and find you and if they, if they want to hire you or whatever or just find your blog or whatever, what's the best way? Georges.blog is where I house all my content. Drop me an email at hello at georges.blog. And to pepper me away in the DMs on LinkedIn is another way to to see my content or drop me a message. That's how I found him. Um, thank you so much, George. You're you're a, a a good one. You're a smart guy, and and um, he he's got a great podcast called the Always Day One, and uh, he has incredible guests. And uh, um, just thanks for coming on the show, and we'll have to catch up again soon. Thank you, sir.